I'm hoping to talk to you today about uh, how we've improved our, our model testing, our machine learning model testing at Ada. Okay, so Ada's mission is broadly to help every customer succeed. And we, uh, we achieve that through building a very easy to use um, automation platform for customer service teams. And so the idea is that they have access to an easy to use tool that, um, that empowers them to take advantage of very powerful conversational AI uh, technology. And, and so basically they can build uh, their companies, their teams, customer support bot or, or whatever use case, and then deploy that in their apps, on their website, across different social channels, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, really helping the customer succeed through empowering customer service teams. So we've got a little video of what the, the chat functionality looks like. And on the right, some of our the clients that we work with. So you can see here the uh, customer types in a question. And, and so in this case, our machine learning is surfacing suggestions based on what they've typed. And if they select one or if they enter their message, they'll receive uh, an answer relating to uh, their question. You can see some of our clients here and uh, you can probably get a sense that they're across uh, a variety of industries and uh, different sizes, et cetera. Uh, and, and in some cases, you know, a, a lot of these companies, one reason they've used ADA is we've um, drastically decreased the amount of time it takes their customers to get support help. And I think, for, for example, Air Asia, before they launched with us, their customers were having something like a 50, 60 minute wait time to get in touch with an agent. And days after they deployed, it was down to, I think, three minutes or so. Because a lot of customers are able to get serviced by the bot. Those that aren't can be handed off within the chat to uh, a live agent. And yeah, so I uh, mentioned this idea of answer prediction here in the video. And so I wanted to give you an, an overview of what that looks like from a machine learning side. So this is all uh, relating to our answer prediction pipeline. And so basically uh, we, we get, we have a, an interface for customer service teams to enter in training questions that are assigned, associated with uh, the answers that their bot can deliver. And in, in the background, what we do is we take those training questions. So they're question and answer pairs. We feed them through uh, our BERT model, our ADA BERT model, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this is basically, uh, if you're not familiar with BERT, it's a very uh, famous language model technology that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the main idea is you can pass in text to this model and uh, it can output uh, vectors and, and those vectors will hold to some extent the uh, semantic or uh, meaning loosely used um, of, of semantics of the text. And so we can feed these vectors, these BERT vectors into a, an intent classifier, a machine learning classifier, and, and train that classifier <clears throat> to be able to predict answers given uh, a piece of text. And so that's what happens uh, in, um, in the chat, as you saw. The customer will type in a, some text, either enter it or will surface the suggestions you saw. And, and we'll do that by feeding in their text to the intent classifier, and it will try and predict what the correct answer is. In this case, it's the promotions answer, and then it'll send that answer to the customer. So that's the, the general idea of how we train and deploy our, our bots. I'm not gonna go into the details uh, about how we built our version of, uh, of BERT, uh, but the, the general idea is we, we use the uh, mass language model task that, that BERT um, was built around. And we combine that with some research from Microsoft uh, called uh, Multitask Deep Neural Networks and uh, trained on our client data, specifically on the answer prediction task. And the, the outcome of this is we found we were able to produce a version of BERT that worked really well for our use case of 
this use case here of predicting uh, answers or intents given a piece of text. So that's the, the A to BERT. Pretty much leave it there. And now I want to get into talking about uh, testing ML models. So usually in machine learning testing, I'd say software uh, testing in general, you want to test on data that you expect to see in production. So that's, that's pretty standard. And in machine learning, that's largely, um, well, that generally will look like taking a set of data. In our case, we have question answer pair data and splitting that into training and test splits. So training questions and, and testing questions. And, and this is pretty standard, regardless if you're building an answer prediction model or um, image detection model. Uh, is very, very common. This is specifically what it looks like. Uh, we, again, break question data into training questions and test questions. Uh, so these are coming from the same data distribution. The training questions, which, again, are question and answer pairs, are fed into BERT, we get the vectors from BERT, feed them into classifier, train the classifier. And once it's trained, we take the testing questions. I didn't put it in here, but we feed those again through BERT. And, and those vectors get sent to the uh, trained model and it generates a set of predictions, what it thinks the correct answer is for each test question. And so those predictions are compared against the ground truth because we know the correct answers for all of our test questions. And in, in doing that comparison, we can generate metrics such as accuracy and F1 score. Basically, uh, how many of the test questions did our model correctly predict the answer for? So that's the, that's the general idea there. And again, this is all pretty standard. Um, but I, I would like to make the argument that typical test data is fairly limited in scope. It's definitely um, much better than not testing, and, and it's not wrong, but it's, it's something that uh, has room for improvement. And so that's where this uh, motivation of this presentation comes from, and I'll get into what we've been doing more recently. Okay, so all this work I'll say now is based on a research paper uh, that I believe was at ACL, um, ACL conference earlier this year. It's a natural language processing uh, conference. And so it's called Beyond Accuracy, Behavioral Testing of NLP Models with Checklist. And Checklist is, I believe, the name of the GitHub repo, if you want to take a look. All of their, their work is open sourced. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get into some of what Checklist was talking about right now. So um, basically, Checklist is, I think, this is part of the motivation of their paper. The test, typical test data is limited in scope. And so what they talk about in the paper, what they propose, is a, a variety of categories of tests, types of tests. And they, they, the main categories they break these down into are minimum functionality tests. So this is, this is basically the type of testing that, that, um, that, we were, that I was showing earlier. At least the, the testing where I was showing earlier fits into minimum functionality tests. This is where you have examples and corresponding labels. So you have basically uh, test data like uh, questions and the associated answers they should belong to. So that would be that data would fit into a, a minimum functionality test of answer prediction. And, and so I'm going to go into some examples, but I'll just give you the definitions now. Invariance tests, this is where you perturb the input data in our, so, so say the text data. And I should say the checklist is, um, is built around NLP, but I think the, the concepts can easily be extended beyond NLP. Uh, so yeah, you perturb your inputs and you expect the model predictions to remain the same. So you're, you're trying to, uh, 
you're trying to evaluate how robust your model is to changes in the data distribution, specifically changes that you don't expect should change its predictions. So that's, that's what invariance tests are getting at. And then directional tests are where you, sort of the opposite, where you perturb your input data and you do expect the model predictions to change. So it's where you perturb it in a specific way such that uh, it should change. Okay, so uh, getting into some examples. For minimum functionality tests, I mentioned that answer prediction is, would, would be, is one of the uh, minimum functionality tests that, that we're doing. So given a, a question, does, is the model able to predict the correct answer? Uh, but the other, some other things we've added on, and, and I should say that the checklist is built with some pre-built um, pre testing types or, or tests for NLP, but it's also built as a platform that you can extend, so you can add your own tests. So I think this gibberish test, uh, actually, no, that one, these ones we've added. So gibberish is where um, we feed in uh, a set of gibberish, mes gibberish messages to a model, and we expect that the predictions coming out of the model uh, should um, have the, the Boolean confident value uh, labeled as false. So basically, the, the model should not be confident in a, this is an answer prediction model, in a gibberish string. So that's what those set of tests evaluate. And so basically, you feed a bunch of different gibberish texts into your model or into your different models and you evaluate how many of them incorrectly get classified as a confident prediction. And similarly uh, with out of domain data, this is where we take questions that shouldn't relate to the domain of um, the bot's answers or, or topics. And we, again, likewise expect that the uh, prediction confidence will be false. We did the same thing for out of scope, which is slightly different, where the data is in the same domain, but it's out of scope of the answer set for that bot. Okay, so those are minimum functionality tests. Invariance tests, this is where uh, we're using some of the built-in tests from checklist. So again, this is where you perturb your input and expect the model prediction to remain the same. So uh, some of the built-in ones are expansions and contractions. So, pardon me, converting words like ain't into is not, aren't into are not, is a, an expansion. So you're it, essentially part of what checklist is uh, proposing is a form of data augmentation for for your test data in order to build more robust models. And, and so, yeah, you're basically expanding your test set by uh, making these changes to your inputs. So contractions, changing is not to ain't. This is just the, the reverse of the expansions, are not to aren't. Typos is, I believe, another built-in one where they just switch a, a couple uh, characters in the input text and, and expect the model to be able to... Uh, account for that and still make the right prediction. And th th this one's, I think, really significant because, um, yeah, you might be testing two different models and they might perform equally well at answer prediction, that task, but one is much more susceptible to making incorrect predictions when there's a typo and the other is, is much better in that regard. And so I think that's a pretty good example of why these kind of tests are important. And adding characters here, again, just adding a, a question mark shouldn't change the correct prediction. And, and so both of these should get the, the same answer. So yeah, that's what the test is doing, evaluating do you get the same answer when you manipulate the text. And lastly, directional tests. So again, this is where you perturb your inputs and you do expect the model prediction to change. So you're perturbing it in a um, I guess, predictable way, assumedly. So for a sentiment analysis task, an example would be uh, if a given sentence has um, 
some sentiment. If you add to that sentiment, that sentence, a phrase like, this is great, you would expect that the, the sentiment would improve. The, the sentiment score of sentence plus this is great should be greater than just the sentence on its own. Uh, so sort of similar to the invariance test, but um, slightly different flavor. And this is a, a brief screenshot of what the interface looks like. And, and so here I've, again, uh, put in the very real scenario where we have our existing Ada BERT model and we want to evaluate something we do fairly often, how well uh, a new version of that model or some different model uh, will perform. And, and so you can see here, uh, there are about, in this case, I think this is just a, a sample. Usually we have more training uh, test samples than this, but here, if you have um, 10 test cases for each of these categories, you can look at what your error rates or failure rates are on each of those tasks and uh, evaluate which model is performing better. So in this case, the new model is, is doing about the same in typos, but it's doing better in uh, adding an extra character and, and also in expansions. So this is, uh, I think, a really cool platform and, and technology that's, that's been released that um, can potentially uh, help you think about how you're testing your ML models and um, maybe what are some blind spots that, that you can start to chip away at and, and improve. I actually had a question for you there um, about different kind of languages and, and what, uh, what's needed and what, uh, what is necessary to diversify ADA into other languages there. Yeah, that's a good question. So we do currently allow customers or chatters to, to talk in a variety of different languages. So uh, we have automatic language detection models and, and you can also manually change your language in the, in the chat. Uh, and, and so, yeah, as you ask a question in Russian or Spanish, Turkish, the, if the bot is set up, if the specific company's bot is set up for that answer, that language, then it will speak to you in, in your language. Uh, it'll yeah, translate wow. your, your messages, yeah. We, we got another question from, uh, from Sanaz. Mm -hmm. He says, how does ADA compare to AWS Lex in performance and intent detection? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually, we did last year do um, a benchmarking uh, experiment that we're, we're likely going to repeat soon, where we uh, took platforms like Lex, Wit.ai, Dialogflow, Watson, and we trained them on the same data that we trained our intent answer prediction model on, and uh, and then tested all of these bots on the same set of test questions. And so we, I think the results are, you can see them on our website, but um, yeah, we did outperform them on, on that task across a variety of different clients. Uh, so, so yeah, we've, and then recently we, we redid it briefly for Watson and um, still, still performing there. So it's, it's it, yeah, crushing yeah. the competition. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the awesome. question. Yeah, so we got to another question from Eric. Uh, Eric said, it seems like identifying the topic of the question can be an efficient way to reach the answer in the space. Dating websites and apps let you use latent uh, LDA. Yeah, uh, allocation for uh, topic modeling. Have you considered this for your conversational robot? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question, Eric. Um, <clears throat> we, yeah, so LDA is a, an unsupervised... Um, learning technique that we have experimented with uh, for different purposes, not for answer prediction. I don't, uh, I guess I could see it be possible to deploy it in that, uh, in that sense, in that domain, but um, where we're deploying similar models to LDA is more around um, identifying the, the cases that, that don't get captured well by, uh, by a bot. And, and aggregating those. So what are the common trends in those cases? Um, so less so for answer prediction, but uh, it's an interesting idea. I'm curious what dating websites you're, you're referring to. Uh, 
um, maybe there's a, a blog post or something. Nigel asks, does ADIS support non-Latin characters such as Korean, Chinese, or Japanese? That's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, thanks, Nigel. I think we may have met actually at a previous meetup, <laughs> but um, we do. Yeah. So, so Korean, definitely Japanese and Chinese are, are supported. I believe Korean too. Yeah, Korean is. And uh, yeah, so chatters can type in those character sets and, and have answers come back in, in the same um, characters. And, and when the answer comes back, it can either be translated by a machine learning model, or if the customer service team is able to, they can write the answers out in like a, an English answer, Korean version, Russian version, et cetera. And if they've done that for an answer, that will be, that will be what's sent to the, the customer. And if not, it'll default to translating it with a, an ML model. Nice. Uh, we got a question from Mansour. Mansour has asked, how do you measure the performance of the model once deployed? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. And <clears throat> that's, I think, always a bit uh, nebulous and something that uh, I think most chatbot companies are, are iterating on because it's, it, it's difficult, difficult to get a perfect signal. You, you might, so we, we get a pretty good signal from uh, customer service or sorry, customer satisfaction reviews surveys, but um, but as with most surveys, you don't always get great um, completion. So we have other signals as well. Um, customers can rate look, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, at, at an answer level, and and so yeah, we can look at those signals. Um, but but it's usually a variety of factors that we're also looking at, like how frequently are the are the bots giving confident predictions. And, and so it's a bit of a balance between all of these things that we're, that we're looking at. Can you provide an example of a question that is in domain but not in scope? Yeah, for sure. So um, when I use the when we use the word domain in this case, uh, we're we're thinking about so a certain domain could be like a banking domain or um, airlines could be another domain. So it's sort of it's like a a subset of topics that that will be using similar language and terminology. So if you're <clears throat> if you're talking about uh, a bot that's built for banking purpose, banking use case, most of the messages that are sent to it are going to be in sort of banking domain, like um, I want to transfer my account or um, where's my money. And, and so a question that is in that domain, but out of scope, would mean it's out of scope of uh, what the bot is built to, to, uh, to talk about, but it still relates to banking. So maybe you don't have an answer for, uh, maybe your bank doesn't have any branches because you're all, um, yeah, it's all online. <clears throat> so if someone says, where are your branches? The bot hasn't been built to, to answer questions about that, it's out of scope from the bot's perspective, but it's still in the banking uh, domain. Hopefully that that answers your question. Which tools and libraries do you use for language translation? Good question. So we, we currently have not built out uh, a language translation model. It's something that we might be doing next year. So we are using the, the Google Translate API, uh, which is pretty convenient in a lot of ways. Uh, it's got a lot of language coverage and, and they have uh, a fairly s strong translation model. So yeah, at the moment, not using a library for it, but, but there are many that you can use. And I, I would say if you're interested in that, um, well, first of all, you, sh you should take a look at multilingual BERT. I think it's, it's a uh, pretty interesting technology for embedding, uh, questions in, in different languages. But then there are many other tools as well for, for training language translation models.